Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Theorem's next session on application security, specifically around APIs, cloud, mobile, and web applications. With that, let's go ahead and get started. As a reminder, Data Theorem is a full stack application security company. So whether it's your mobile apps, single page web apps, RESTful APIs, or even cloud applications, we are a full stack company looking at your applications from end to end, all as a core goal to prevent AppSec data breaches, which is down there below. Now today's session is about contact tracing applications, specifically on iOS and Android. If you are the author or a publisher of a contact tracing mobile app, this webinar is for you. If you're a user of one of these apps, this webinar is probably too in depth. Uh, there's other webinars we have as a user of these applications, but today we are talking to the developers of contact tracing apps and quite frankly, giving you a to-do list, a top 10 to-do list to make sure you're not caught off guard by any privacy or security mistake you have in your application. A lot of the people who are writing these apps are nonprofits. They're not necessarily um, from software companies. So we're providing this as a tactical uh, way to get the privacy and security of your app up to speed because the data you have in it is obviously highly sensitive, but we also understand you're possibly a nonprofit. So there's only so much you can do um, to, uh, to essentially have the software engineering to uh, protect data that you have access to. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? One thing to note, while this is a top 10, there's probably 35 things I personally would like you to do, but I've reduced it to 10 to make sure we're practical in terms of what can be done um, versus the time you have allotted for other features that your users may want. So the first thing is obvious, do not track. Um, that might seem obvious because you're using maybe the Google or Android contact tracing API, which does not track users um, or who they are specifically. All that is kind of stored client side on their device. However, there's a lot of things that you can accidentally do to track the users of your app without you knowing it. For example, a lot of third party software and open source SDKs embed tracking information to collect demographic data on your users. If you're using any of these, you might be tracking your users without even knowing it. So for example, on iOS, there's two ways to identify a user. Uh, one is called the IDFA, and the other is called the IDFV. The IDFV is the more private one. That's the one you wanna use. You don't wanna use the IDFA. Um, and there's a long list of other examples here. Don't collect your user's Wi-Fi address. Don't collect their Mac address. Don't collect their location. Don't collect their Android ID. On Android, instead of using the IMEI and Android ID for tracking, you use the Google Advertiser ID, which is similar to the iOS IDFV. It's an anonymous um, uh, value that doesn't track the user nor their device and is not hardware centric. So this is a very important one because people are using your contact tracing app, they're trusting you and they don't wanna be known essentially. So you gotta make sure you do not track them outside the algorithm that you use from your, um, from your country or even the Google and Apple one that they created for contact tracing. The second thing rolls into that when you develop a Android and iOS app, you're, using, you're usually using 18 to 20 pieces of open source libraries or third party SDKs. Now as a reminder, a lot of the commercial SDKs use the premium model where they're not taking dollars as currency, but your data is currency or their users data. So your users locations, um, the device information from your users or the behavior is the currency they use to provide you with a freemium tool for like analytics, crash reporting, or user experience. So you need to remove all these third-party trackers. You're not selling your users data for advertisement. So while analytics might be great, the trade-off for your users location is not. So you need to remove all open source libraries and third-party SDKs that are using a freemium model where they're taking your users location or device information. Um, yes, there's probably going to be a functionality trade-off, but in this case, the functionality is probably not worth it to your users' trust of, in terms of uh, what data is being collecting from them and sold by, 
sold to a third party analytics firm. All right, number three, reduce the location access you have of your users. Obviously, this is a contact tracing application. So tracing requires location information, but you don't need to know every single location step um, or whereabouts of your users. So for example, on iOS, you should be using a option that says look, um, track the location of the user while they're using your app, but not always. So when the app is not being used or in the background. Um, on Android, there's a couple options. One is called the find location and one is called the course location. You wanna use the course location and not the find location. So obviously for contact tracing apps, you do need, do need to use location, but use the least amount of location you possibly can get and not just always tracking the user no matter what. Reduce the photo access. In fact, I would say don't use the photo, address, uh, uh, photo address. You don't need access, hopefully, to the user's photo roll. If there's a feature that requires it, I would say get rid of the feature. But if you do need it on iOS, there's a ways where you can write to the photo roll or just select one photo um, called the photo image picker without getting full access to the photo roll itself. In Android, that option is not available, so I would say any feature that requires the photo um, roll just simply isn't used. Um, I would not use that. And the reason why I'm saying that is there's location data in everyone's photo. So the photo is often used to track a user's location. So if you can't limit that, just don't reduce, uh, don't use it at all. Number five. Um, secure the data, put it in secure storage. So on iOS, you should be using the secure enclave. The secure enclave is the same data where Apple stores touch ID information. So it's the most secure part of the iOS operating system and you should be using it too for any secure data you're writing to disk. Make sure you use the secure enclave. On Android, um, use private storage. Do not use the SD card or any other external storage use the private storage on Android. In both situations, do not back up the user's data to Apple or Google. This is a relationship between a COVID-19 user and your nonprofit organization. Um, Apple and Google are usually not involved here, so do not back up their data to the iCloud environment or Google, um, Google Drive. So here are two code level recommendations of how not to back up your app's data to Apple or Google, which is enabled by default. So if you don't do anything, you're backing up your user's data to Apple and Google, they may or may not like that. So our recommendation is should uh, set off the default so it's actively not um, backing up their data to these um, for-profit organizations. Number six, enforce TLS. Now you're probably using TLS. Using TLS is different than enforcing TLS. So if there's any active attack on your users, which there will be because you're a COVID-19 app, you have valuable data, um, not like credit card information, but if someone is infected with COVID-19, there's people who would might want to know about that, but they're using their, your app for safety reasons. So you don't want to necessarily have that accessible to anyone on a coffee shop Wi-Fi network. So you must enforce TLS. On iOS, that's used uh, by something called ATS. On Android, that's used by something called NSC. Server side, because obviously you uh, have server side APIs, you want to enable HSTS and OSCP. And then finally, you want to make sure TLS 1.3 is used at all times. This is not easy stuff, but it's stuff that you need to do to not only use TLS, but enforce it and use it correctly. So make sure you've placed close attention number six because your users are going to be using this app in insecure locations, whether it's a coffee shop, um, a hotel, out in public, it's going to be used in hostile networks. So you gotta make sure TLS is enforced strongly at all times. Number seven, make sure the most secure versions of iOS and Android are being used. Currently right now, that is iOS 14 and Android 30. Those should be set as your target SDKs. Minimum SDKs can be whatever you choose to get the widest audience, but your SDK targets for iOS should be 14 and for Android should be 30. Number eight, if you're requiring authentication of your app, make sure you use two-factor authentication and system-managed passwords. 
there are easy ways to do this, honestly, in iOS, starting in iOS 13, where you can enforce two-factor auth and system managed passwords automatically and providing a great user experience. So if you're requiring authentication, we highly recommend using the iOS 13 features for two-factor auth and system managed passwords. Number nine, um, making sure the device is secure. So on Android, that is something called, uh, something called safety net, where if you install safety net, it will make sure the device which your app is running on is also secure as well. Number nine is using Trustkit. This is an open source project authored by the chief architect of Datatherm. So there is some uh, personal bias I have here. My coworker wrote this as a fantastic um, open source library free of charge to make sure SSL is not being attacked on your app. And if it's so, it will defend against any SSL attacks. So here's a, a dashboard you get free of charge actually if you use Trustkit. Um, and if you use it, not only will it defend against SSL attacks, it will make sure SSL is always enforced and it will show you where in the world your, uh, your uh, apps um, are being attacked and again, defending them in real time. So you can see a screenshot here from the dashboard where this particular test app had 20 tick, 21 attacks and you can see 21 blocks. If you ever see those numbers different, then someone has successfully attacked SSL. And again, the type of data you have, even though it's not credit card information, it is very sensitive information. So you wanna make sure any SSL attacks are blocked in real time. And then finally, your APIs. Your data um, in your app can be leaked via server-side APIs. So you need to make sure your APIs are strongly authenticated the authorization is enforced and any encryption is enforced. So make sure those server-side APIs, which probably are in a cloud, AWS GCP or Amazon, I'm sorry, AWS GCP or Azure are locked down in terms of authentication, authorization, and encryption. And that is it for the top 10. As you can imagine, this is probably overwhelming. So Datatherm is committed to obviously helping organizations, especially nonprofits, uh, for the safety of the community. So if you are a nonprofit and you're overwhelmed by this top 10, contact us at COVID-19 at datatherm.com and we will scan your app free of charge and we help, will help you get these top 10 things also free of charge. So we will help you on this journey. Some of it is very easy. Some of it is not very easy, but either way, Data Theorem is committed to the safety of our entire global community. So go ahead and email us at COVID-19 at datatherm.com. We will help you get to this top 10 free of charge. So the safety and the privacy of you, your, your users uh, can happen as quickly as possible. And that's about it. If you have any questions about Data Theorem or this top 10, feel free to contact us at any time. With that, stay safe, everyone. Stay healthy and have a great rest of your day.